Our esteemed speaker this evening has over 20 years of high-performance web-scale infrastructures, of experience in creating high-performance uh, web-scale infrastructures. Please welcome uh, the CTO and founder of Aerospike, Brian Wolgowski. So uh, this is my third database month, so I guess I'm, does that make me a regular guy? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Uh, every month is database month. Every day is month. Absolutely. Uh, and the other uh, question from uh, App Nexus was uh, which executive uh, resigns today? And that would be Mike Nolan. So if you're not up on your blog posts, uh, that happened. I got news in the last like 30 minutes. So okay, so uh, what we're going to talk about today is um, how to get your analytics and your transaction processing in one database and some of the techniques that we've found that allow you to do such a thing. So background, um, analytics, you know, that's doing queries involving lots of rows, right? Transaction processing, OLTP, your operational data store. That's the thing that's actually on the front lines responding to requests. <clears throat> so uh, how many people know what TLDR means? Okay, we got about a third there. My, my co-founder didn't, so I passed the slide deck button. He's like, what the heck does that mean? So uh, that means too long, don't read. So if you don't remember anything else from this conversation, um, I'll, I'll present this again at the end. <clears throat> so what we found is that most databases doing analytics don't operate on a row-by-row -row basis. They operate on tables. They're using streaming disk subsystems because that's, that's what we have, right? We had until now, disk was really the, the only storage system of, 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 that was uh, available. Um, so what we found at Aerospike is uh, row-based is easy to scale, and I'll tell you why, but basically it's a big hash table, big hash table scale. Um, and it is re that's really, really fast for the kind of operational transactions without joints, denormalized operational transactions, big hash table, right? Turns out it's really predictable for analytics because you don't have the problem where you have rows all next to each other and noisy neighbors. <clears throat> so it's super predictable. Uh, and it turns out it's fast because you can use uh, lock-free, uh, fine-grained locks and a different scheduling algorithms. And when you use that with Flash and RAM, you can get a lot of the power of the other systems and uh, still hit higher levels of scale. So this is very much in-memory techniques, but I'll also tell you what role Flash is playing in making all this stuff a reality. Okay, so back off for a second. <clears throat> What's the database landscape? You know, we've got all of our old friends in OLAP and OLTP. Then we've got our new big data friends. We've got a nice friendly elephant out there. <clears throat> and we've also got now architectures that have an operational store, usually for behaviors. Right, so in terms of financial services, that might be your fraud database, it might be a uh, transaction study, uh, user profile state, and in advertising, which of course this is the hotbed of the universe, is probably here plus about seven blocks, um, for user profile storage within advertising. That's the stuff that's on the front line allowing you to optimize moment by moment for different ads. So the challenges of trying to uh, build a database for the, this kind of system, for very high scale profile storage, <clears throat> very high levels of reads and writes. So unlike a lot of systems and a lot of content management systems that are heavily read biased, and a lot of analytic systems that are also heavily, well, they tend to be all write for a while and then all read for a while. They don't tend to mix their transactions, right? Um, but the operational data stores that we've had to build in Aerospy reads and writes at the same time because you need fast changes based on behavior. Uh, hotspots, you gotta avoid hotspots. That's the way you make sure that your database stays operationally predictable. Um, you wanna provide consistency, you wanna provide linear scale, and especially being able to add capacity without service interruption. And that's really what these new internet enterprises need. <clears throat> Google doesn't go down, at least not that much. Right? Uh, my Gmail is, gets a little wonky now, but it's pretty much okay. Um, and it's all very fresh, it's all very behavioral, it's all very personalized and customized. So since you, in order to convince you that I actually know something about this topic, 
Um, this is a small portion of our customer list. It's about half of our deployed customers. So if there's names you recognize out, out there, um, some of them like Ad China, largest advertising company in China, uh, Exalate right around the corner, great company selling data, buying and selling data. Uh, App Lovin, I think the strangest name on the list, that's uh, Nick Lovin, basically is what they named the company after, but it's for app, uh, mobile apps. So uh, a lot of folks out there using our uh, database, and also uh, Mike had a great uh, quote that came out in Information Week uh, regarding our database. <coughs> so uh, suggest you check that out. And uh, we are founded by a bunch of uh, my co-founder, uh, Srini, Srini Wasan, is an old database at <coughs> University of Wisconsin. I'm more on the networking distributed systems side, um, and we're funded by a combination of uh, Draper Associates, if you know Tim Draper, it seems like he's on television doing some of the VC stuff uh, a lot. Uh, Alsop Louie, which is a boutique firm out of San Francisco, and NEA, one of the largest firms in the world. So, um, What's, what's necessary about these operational stores? Predictable latency is one of the hallmarks of being an operational store. You have to be able to present not just high th good throughput, but you also want to see your throughput be very stable and latency out towards the edge of your curve. Um, what you also want is a system that will stay stable even in the face of uh, downtime and hardware failures and switch failures. So if you've ever, if some of you guys are operational and you've actually had the problem of switches going down, rack failures, PSUs blowing, all that kind of stuff, um, if you need your system to stay up, as is necessary in a lot of these internet systems, exactly the characteristics of failure in these cluster databases is absolutely critical. There's a company, uh, I think they're actually based out of uh, Dumbo, and called Thumbtack Technology. They're a partner of all of these different companies, uh, Air Us, uh, uh, Datastacks, Mongo, and also Couch. They wanted to do a report to try to help their customers sort through who's who in NoSQL, because they deploy a bunch of all of this kind of stuff as consultants. And so they did a benchmark. So all of these numbers are based on the Yahoo Cloud Serving benchmarks, YCSB. It's all downloadable open source code, as well as their report on the different scale factors, as well as how the different databases respond when you're actually uh, seeing a failure. The way that um, we are able to do this as an operational store is through a shared nothing clustered system. And the benefit of this system is the distribution system being row by row. So um, the standard distributed hash table is uh, one of the keys of scaling in a lot of these systems. Um, but we've taken a few different twists to it. You can think of this as your homegrown sharded system where we have a large number of shards but we can move them around moment by moment based on operational failures, loads, replication counts, uh, increases in capacity. The benefit of what we're doing here, different from some of the other systems, is the form of random distribution we have of the partitions. So if a particular partition is mastered on node two, its replica is then randomly chosen as well. The benefit is when one of those machines stops working, a random number, uh, this, uh, a particular number of, of um, shards become slow and then have to be re-replicated. But that load is the same across the entire system. So the predictability compared to, say, a, um, a corded system, right? So an accorded system like Mongo, it's the next server in the chain that has to be replicated and becomes hot. So what we've really done is to become a really great operational row store, a really great key value store, we had to really think through how to make the system super random so that you never ever get a hot spot. And when you do have to recover from an operational problem, it happens pretty, pretty manually, automatically. It happens very automatically and it happens uh, with the least operational impact. Because as you get larger and larger clusters, you start seeing more and more failures. And this system is built uh, to have a modest cluster size. So it's not built for cluster sizes greater than about 100 servers. Uh, what we find in those servers is Cassandra-style architectures are actually superior because they, uh, since they don't have as much node-to-node -node communication and synchronization, they don't need to synchronize, and they can be more robust in the, in the face of larger and larger failure sets. Now, we have some architectures for larger clusters, what we call super clusters, clusters of clusters. 
However, we've also found that we don't actually need to do them for most problem sets. Um, some of our, our larger customers, like AppNexus, are commonly running uh, north of a million transactions per second. That's the real-time bidding uh, load right now within North America. We have one cluster that's expected 5 million transactions per second. And we're at about 10 servers uh, with modern servers on this system. So um, one thing I like to say is if you've got 100 servers in your cluster, maybe you're doing it wrong. Uh, the other possibility is that you actually have a multi-petabyte uh, problem, in which case you should be on Hadoop. This system is good up to about 100 terabytes. With some of the new flash subsystems, it'll be good up through about a petabyte. But you can do that all with modest-sized clusters, which is beneficial operationally because you don't have as many failures per cluster per time, unit time. So we've, we focus on that particular area. Um, skip, okay, let's go through this order. So um, an important thing about being a row-oriented architecture is to touch as few servers as possible, especially on an individual write, and still maintain data consistency. You'll see how this impacts analytics and analytics workloads in a minute. So the way that we write data is there's a master and a replica, but that's only for transactions and for data, like I said, in the partition system. Operationally, there aren't master nodes or um, uh, uh, slave nodes. All nodes are the same. Every server has essentially, if you think in Hadoop terms, the name node map is baked into it. So you don't have any extra uh, uh, shard system or cluster servers that you have to keep up and running. If the cluster is up and running, then the naming system and sharding system is already up and running. <clears throat> so what's interesting about the system in this is that row by row is where you have the individual locks and the individual at atomicity guarantees from the database sets. So row by row, we take a latch as we are copy, uh, getting the data uh, replicated onto the other server. The benefit is, since, we're, since it is a row by row atomicity guarantee, you can get a higher level of scale. And that's very important to operational systems where predictability is key. The client also knows about this same roadmap and the same transactional guarantees. So the client library isn't simply HTTP talking to some particular server. It actually has to be aware of where the data map is so that it can talk to the server that is master or one of the replicas for this piece of data. That short circuits, short, short circuits one network hop, which is absolutely important in this day and age. So we offer uh, clients that have uh, for C, uh, uh, async C through live events, uh, uh, Java native, C sharp native, and then we build a lot of the other languages like Python, Ruby, Erlang, etc. on top of that. Of course, Scala is built on top of the JVM based system. So let's let's get over to Flash, because that's I think things get a lot more interesting here. So the benefit of doing row by row operations for analytics is already kind of well known within analy within for in-memory databases. The problem with in-memory databases like HANA is really only the cost, right? So uh, I'll take you through that. Uh, actually, let's do that right now. Next slide. So uh, I just went through Dell's price list recently, uh, trying to show sort of what the difference is between two different configurations. Now, Aerospike supports both RAM for some data sets and also SSD for others. Most of our customers run a blend, but these numbers are, are, are pretty impressive. And this is even fairly expensive flash. So in order to get the TPS per server at, at, at that high load, that's at the same point where the network becomes the bottleneck. For a standard 8-core or 12-core uh, machine, it's very hard to push more than about 500,000 TCP transactions in and out of a server already. So that becomes the bottleneck. If you can get your flash also running at 500, what's the point in actually uh, getting uh, going to RAM at that point? Uh, so for row-based operations where you're simply, you know, one transaction, operational store, get that row, get out of Dodge, suddenly Flash becomes really the broad middle of uh, storage solutions, direct attached Flash. This particular uh, device that I priced against is uh, called the Micron P320H, which I mentioned the last time I was here at New York. So I'm not going to go too deep into uh, the new current Flash devices, uh, the prices and the trends in that area, except to say that I'm really excited. Um, Flash Memory Summit. Uh, so, so a lot of the social network companies have really figured out the value that Flash brings to their application because they can create 
uh, richer applications with a lot more capabilities in terms of finding all of your friends. That soaks up a lot of transactions. Your friends of your friends. All of that social graph work is very well suited to a random road-based system, and Flash really helps. So we know that Facebook and Apple contributed $200 million to Fusion IO's bottom line. At the time, Fusion IO was one of the few suppliers of Flash to the enterprise. Uh, we know this from Fusion IO's public filings. <clears throat> at the Flash Memory Summit in Santa Clara, which was about a little over a month ago, uh, Facebook had a really interesting keynote where they talked about this architecture. And they talked about how random access in the database was really driving what their application could do to the point that they've doubled down and they're buying an Exomite, a flash hardware this year. Uh, according to my calculations, that's maybe about $1.2 billion worth of flash hardware. They might be getting a deal. Uh, some people are saying that Apple paid maybe 50 cents uh, for their flash, and there certainly is flash priced that way, and at these volumes they might be getting it. So that 1.2 billion, that's, that's a, that might, might be lower, but somewhere around a billion dollars worth from that exabyte of flash that Facebook is buying. Now what they're doing is they're doing that direct attach. They've got their own database hardware, and they've got en uh, engineers that have optimized uh, versions of MySQL and also some of the other uh, database systems to work with this. They know the power of this kind of random system where you don't have to rely on um, uh, the streaming optimizations that were necessary back in the old rotational disk days. So back to this particular picture, what we basically got is the fact that RAM, I just picked uh, 200 gigabytes for the, this particular picture because that was the sweet spot right now on Dell's price list of price per byte. So if you want the lowest price per byte, you actually have to buy nearly 110 servers to get all the way up to a 10 gig system. Now people who are implementing HANA will tell you they will typically buy a terabyte per server, but they'll pay a premium to get that uh, higher density and those particular kinds of servers. So you can build something like this with only 20 servers, but you'll actually do it at a higher price than this particular bottom line. When I present this normally to a flash conference, I point out that you know, if I'm trying to talk my VP into a, a new project, I might be able to talk him into $200,000. I'm going to have a heck of a time with new math, new optimizations, talking anyone into $4 million. That's, that's kind of hard in this day and age. So if you want to start out, you definitely want to be in Flash. If you can get similar performance, why wouldn't you be there? Uh, I was giving a version of this in China, and the guys were like, wait, 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 we don't even have 10 terabytes. And like, we care very much about price. And I did a, a whiteboard pencil for them, and I showed them how they were going to save $20,000 just on the first 200 gigabytes, flash versus RAM, and both were going to meet their speed requirements. So, you know, do you want to, say, who doesn't want to spend, save $20,000 right off the bat using a flash optimized system? And that was based uh, compared to Redis. So, these numbers are pretty exciting, and they're only going to get better. Well, what I saw on the Flash Memory Summit out of Samsung's 3D Flash, uh, Intel's new roadmap on 2D Flash, is everything's going to get uh, denser and denser and uh, cheaper per byte over the next uh, over the next five years for sure. Uh, these roadmaps are showing things like 10 terabyte, two and a half inch drives, 10 terabyte laptop size drives. Okay, that's what's on there. Everyone's roadmap for about two-ish years. Uh, this is all public. Uh, Samsung basically blew the world away when they presented their, uh, at Flash Memory Summit, when they presented their keynote showing their entire 10-year roadmap, showing that they are on Moore's Law curve for Flash of denser, 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 and they're going 3D. Everyone thought that maybe lithography was going to start having a problem as a cell size once they went 3D, started stacking bits up. You know, it's, it's a whole other world again, and we've got 10 years worth of 18-month doubles. Now, it's not going to go any faster, is the unfortunate thing. Just like CPUs, we've hit a clock speed limit. So don't expect flash. It might get a little faster, you know, 20% here or there. The speed you're seeing now, the optimization patterns that are necessary now, that's what's going to happen for the future. However, we're going to have a higher density, lower cost per byte. Um, my crystal ball says that rotational disk and flash will probably cross paths in about three years. At that point, there's not going to be any point in buying rotational disk for anyone. 
So Wait, when you say cross paths, what do you mean? Uh, the price, price per mile. Okay. So right now, price per mile. So if you're speed sensitive, flash is already winner ten to one. Uh, if you're price per byte sensitive, rotational disk still has, you know, maybe a five to one edge depending on where you're getting your flash, what speed you need. Five to one, maybe even ten to one. Um, that's that's going to grow very very quickly, especially with uh, Samsung's new offerings. We don't know exactly how they're going to price them, but um, uh, Flash is, is uh, I think predicted to hit to go under uh, rotational disk price per byte in about three years. And at that point, you're just going to say, well, that, that's the end of rotational price, uh, just like paper tape. Anyone still using paper tape? Anyone remember paper tape? <laughs> Excellent. Okay, so the point here is that all of the optimizations that you've heard about for in-memory computing are also available with flash, scale, and dynamics. So um, one of the reasons I had the trivia questions about Michael Stonebreaker was he was one of the ones who popularized H store and C store, column stores and row stores, and uh, with his Vertica engine, really showed the power of using column stores for analytics. What I'm going to point out here is there are some problems and some real better, some, some problems that are better solved with analytics on a row by row basis if you can make rows scale, just like I showed you in the previous section. So how do you do that? Well, you still need to pick a particular subset of those rows for processing. Because if you have a table scan problem, you should probably be using Hadoop and be using getting advantage of all of those table scans. However, the processing involved in, um, in any analytic system is very much based on the individual rows that you have and picking up a particular row. Once you have an L1 cache on your CPU, it's very fast to uh, deserialize it, do whatever kind of operations, uh, do any kind of rich operations you want. Those happen very quick. It's really the data motion of getting the storage, the, the, the bytes, from someplace on storage over onto your main CPU core um, and getting a thread to uh, actually be acting on it and then do that work. So a lot of the overhead really is work based. So if you want to have a query system based on rows, the first thing you need is you need secondary indexes that simply have references to the primary indexes. This means you don't have, multi in database speak, you don't have multiple materialized views. You only have one materialized view, and then you have a lot of indexes pointing at it. So the benefit of that is when you have this primary key index in the storage layer that is also very random, you're still going to get the smoothness of a system uh, in your query system. So there's an optimization pattern, you're probably used to it if you've heard about graph databases, of trying to put your graph and localize it all on one machine or all, on different machines and trying to push the, the data around so that it's co-located. Well, that's a, that's a really good optimization for some data sets. However, it becomes a real problem because then, well, what if you add one link and suddenly you want to move half of that data somewhere else? You're constantly playing this game of moving back and forth based on your data pattern. And in my experience, that's really one of the real problems with predictability. Once you have your performance dependent on your data pattern, you're going to have a lot of these things. And you see this actually in MongoDB, right? Because they, they split their, uh, uh, their data at different points. You insert a little bit, then it has to split. Then you insert, then it has to split. Um, same thing with this, uh, those kinds of graph databases. Whereas if you stick to row by row, and that row is going to be planted on a single server, and the indexes for it are on the same server, you've got a very high level of predictability that is independent of the individual uh, system. Another point to notice here is indexes don't really have to be persistent in the modern age. And this is one thing that we found out at Aerospike is um, if you have multiple HA servers, well, that index is already on another server. The data is safe. So we use one technique, which is uh, with our indexes, which are in memory, uh, we can restart the process and not lose that memory. You put in shared memory storage, you push it off to the side, and then you can restart your process, reattach to it, and off your uncle. Just within seconds, you can do a process restart. Now, if you have to do a full restart, at least you've got the power of flash underneath you actually helping you rebuild times. So we commonly find in a full cluster restart, 
have a rebuild time of about 15 minutes. Now, that's only, that only happens when you're really shutting down a data center. And frankly, getting your data center back up in 15 minutes is usually considered to be a pretty good thing already. So we haven't had a lot of complaints about that. Um, so if your secondary indexes are working in memory in this kind of scheme, what that means is your query has to go touch all servers, right? Because you don't know where it is, so you've got to go ask everyone. So this kind of optimization is powerful when you're touching multiple rows. Now that's primarily an analytics style solution. <clears throat> MapReduce is another way of looking at these kinds of queries, but it's an indexed form of MapReduce. So instead of thinking about MapReduce as a big table scan, you can still think of it as a query over a collection or a subset of your data. That's one of the most powerful ways to get a speed improvement in a MapReduce style of programming because you're touching much, many fewer rows. As I said, what we found is that the number of rows you touch is really the barrier to speed in a lot of these systems. It's not so much the IOs anymore, and it's not so much the network anymore. There's still some IO penalty in there. Uh, you can answer some of that by going with pure in memory if you need to. Um, but being able to simply touch a million rows instead of a billion, that's a huge win. So if you can do that one bit of indexing, if you can find one initial index to your MapReduce pipeline, think of it as not just MapReduce, but in fact a filter pipeline in terms of SQL, you can actually get very, very good performance. So in the ad tech world, this kind of thing would be say, let's say I want to calculate the current value of a campaign or the last 10 minute touches on a campaign. I might have an index on time, so I touch only uh, uh, rows that have been changed in the last 10 minutes. That's not that many. And I can do a, a full recompute of statistics based on that very, very rapidly, in a matter of seconds, in fact, and still use the MapReduce tools that, that people would know and love. Once you take that step of MapReduce, bringing this all the way out to a SQL-style optimizer with predicate analysis, is not that far along. And you know, I think everyone's been considering that the, no, the, the benefits of NoSQL scalability are going to be moving into, uh, uh, in, into using more of the SQL language predicate systems. There's already a lot of subsets of SQL. Um, mainly, I think all of us are trying to stay away from trying to uh, implement an entire SQL, especially with large joins. Large joins are inherently fairly non-scalable um, and are best done on single servers. So our strategy is to try to not allow people to do the kinds of operations like that. If you're doing that, stay on a relational system, stay on a vertical scale system. There's a lot you can do with that large scale joints. So the takeaway from this point is that the selectivity of a query, the number of rows you're touching, really is the best determinant of the amount of load on a database system. So what happens if you try to combine your operational store that is your OLTP store that's on the front line of your service with doing some analytics. Now it's not gonna be all of your analytics, right? You've still got those big warehouses and you've got your 20 petabyte to store back there. But what if you're trying to do some analytics on that side? Typically that's considered to be, you know, uh, uh, fantasy. You wouldn't try to actually do large queries on your operational system because it will slow down, it'll get hurt, it won't be able to respond predictably. So imagine a system like this where you have those operational query, those operational single row key value store uh, requests coming in. And then you've also got these queries coming in of the style that I mentioned that are all being filtered through this secondary index. All of them have to go to the primary key index in order to access a row. Now all of your load is on a row by row basis, which means that this is the perfect choke point to do your prioritization. This allows you to do uh, deadline scheduling of your operational queues. If you've got 10 milliseconds to make a database request and it's been 20, you kill it right there before it actually impacts the rest of the, the, the system, part of the system that has the most load, which is here. Similarly, you can stream these index hits into this subsystem and allow that to trickle through according to whatever prioritization scheme you'd like to have. So a lot, there's a lot of benefits to this system. Um, one is uh, the scheduler in a distributed system can get kind of tricky because you're trying, often trying to look at the, uh, the effects on different systems. The benefit of this falls, uh, falls out of the fact that it's a very random server-by-server -server system. 
So um, the fact that it's randomly done means you can calculate and do your priority queue scheduling on this one server and have it be correct for all of the other servers at the same time with no coordination, which is one of the deaths of distributed system. Um, rows are also very fine-grained. Now the point there is you can still do writes to this system and not be blocking a lot of your analytics queries. Now you're still going to have to worry about consistency there, right? Because it's a distributed system and you've got writes during your query, you're going to get one answer or the other. You're guaranteed not to get both. You're going to get one version of that row if you have a write coming in at the same time. And there's sort of not a way around that. If you want parallelism and you want this kind of capability, you have to give up and a little bit and allow your, the row to be the atomicity guarantee in the isolation row. So based on that, what are some of the common thoughts you might have about um, building an operational store and a uh, hot analytics store? Um, well, the first, first idea is, you know what? The biggest problem with running these things is actually sizing them correctly so that under a, a particular level of load, did you buy enough hardware? Well, the good news about using this kind of row-based system for doing your computation is uh, your calculation of server cost is you say, well, we can handle this amount of selectivity of your queries. Well, is it this kind of a select? Is it an order by? Is it X, is it Y? All you need to do is figure out the number of rows those queries are going to touch, and that's the size of system you have. So the exact ins and outs of the queries are much simpler, allowing the DBA's life to become much easier, and then allowing you to size your cluster appropriately. Because as a software guy, if you don't have enough hardware, you know, at, there's only so much I can do, right? So there's a law of physics there at some point. So it becomes easy to estimate. Second of all, you can simply add a new cluster node. Everything I just said about the scalability of the system applies by simply adding a new server. You don't have any data locality, so adding a new server, randomly pushing some of that data across, allows you to simply get the right kind of scale. Second challenge with these kinds of systems is just what's the size of my cluster that's needed. You can be scalable, but then st simply be unaffordable. Well, the system that we've already proven out, and the numbers we showed from the, the first portion of the, uh, we're showing very high performance numbers of 500,000 rows per second against, uh, 500,000 rows per second against flash. And internally, when not going across the network, we can easily hit 5 million to 10 million rows per second, even when invoking user-defined functions as you would do in a MapReduce. So 10 million rows per second on a fairly commodity, uh, say a, you know, a 12G Dell server, um, we think allows you to, to actually hit some pretty interesting performance numbers. Uh, third point I think I sort of already made before, which is often in DBA land, you have to sit there and think about exactly the forms of the queries and the impact that query is going to have on your system. When you simply say, um, I don't care what the query is, I only care about the number of rows touched, you're able to calculate, um, and as your data shifts, you also don't have to create new indexes. Well, you have to create new indexes to touch fewer rows. But you can also simply say, well, what's the trade-off? If I'm not going to create an index, well, then I'm going to create a, I'm going to have more, more rows touched. Then I know what the cost of that is. So the, uh, the ability to uh, predict the scalability of the system and uh, whether to create a new index becomes a lot clearer. So fourth, uh, so the, the the first four, three points were really about trying to avoid degradation and make your database fast enough for your load. The fourth point is a little more interesting, um, uh, theoretically, which says, okay, I still have peaks. I still have a query that I didn't really expect. It had a higher selectivity. What's actually going to happen to my core database? Um, well, the benefit of this kind of architecture is, going back to it, the fact that this priority queue allows you to very cleanly separate out the load and allows you to do scheduling according to some very normal priority queue style algorithms. So you can make sure, dead sure, that that operational load is getting through, even if it chokes out your analytics. Or it can allow you to uh, allow your analytics to continue happening even to the detriment of your operational store if that's the policy you want. So this system offers very graceful degradation. Um, and these, these forms of heap style priority data queues are very, very well understood uh, in RAM, and the capability of scaling them out to multi cores actually works very well as well. Um, oh, I was thinking about this as actually as I was writing the slide. 
Um, an interesting point is when you have a partial result from one of these queries, since the underlying block store is highly random, your partial result is an unbiased sample. So what that means is, if you did a query and you only got 10% of the data back, in a standard database, you might just get the oldest 10%, right? But in this, you're actually going to get a random 10% which allows you to then infer st uh, statistically uh, what the rest of the system, is, uh, the, the query is going to be. That can be of great interest when your database is under load and you're only getting partial responses. Okay, uh, fifth point about uh, column stores, since I was going to get back to uh, Mr. Stonebreaker and all of his efforts. The, um, there are still a point for column-oriented stores because only touching data and touching a subset of the data, because you only really want to look at one column, is another way of doing this, and there will be cases where this outperforms a row-based store. Now the challenge is this one. So if I'm doing a column-based store system, I have to write different materialized views. I have to write different versions of the columns in different spots on disk, right? So depending on how I lay out that data, queries are going to perform differently. Okay, that's not so bad until someone says, hey, let's change the query pattern, let's change the schema. Then suddenly you have to rewrite your database, not just an index in memory, but you actually have to change the data layout on disk. And that's a real barrier to agility and uh, uh, improving functional changes. However, this, this kind of optimization can still go faster than the kind of row-based system. It's just less flexible. So, last point. Um, there's going to be still a fear of trying to run some analytics on your operational store. Until this kind of technology gets proven out, until you see it in production, I wouldn't trust it either. I mean, you hear some crazy guy in front of a room in a meetup, but what is he doing, right? So, that's okay, right? Um, what we've done at Aerospike is we have cluster replication that is high availability and distributed. So if you want to create that analytics store and create, have that operational store, have that be separate for a period of time until you see how the whole thing plays out, possibly with different cluster sizes, fine, go ahead and do that. It's, it's, it's a very natural thing. Nobody has really said it up until now that it's possible to really bring these two stores together in a predictable and safe fashion. So we're expecting that, it's fine with us, and we have an answer for that. It's our cross data center replication product, which can also be used inside one data center in the case of wanting to have an analytics server uh, cluster as well as a uh, uh, operational store. <clears throat> so a little bit about where Aerospike is on the journey to this particular world. We recently released Aerospike 3, we went GA uh, eight days ago. And our goal was to create the, has been to create the modern real-time data platform. Um, besides what I've talked about today, We've also included the ability to do user-defined functions, to uh, com uh, compute within the uh, server. Uh, this is a pretty important function, uh, and it's one of the things that's, going back to Stonebreaker again, that he did uh, quite well within VoltDB, is the ability to use user-defined functions to get flexibility. Um, when Stonebreaker wrote the seminal paper that the database layer needs a rewrite, he, he prophesied a world of thousands upon thousands of new database companies, which was um, obviously prescient, because we're living that world now. Um, however, we believe that user-defined functions allow customization of that database and allow you to solve different problems. Okay, let's say you've got a PubSub problem. Great. Take your user-defined function, hook it up to your queue, and then be able to blast uh, uh, updates out. Uh, you've got a problem where you need to do a particular kind of Fourier transform over the last uh, 24 hours of your data. Great. Store that user's data in place using a, a large data type uh, storage system, and then write your own function to be able to do that instead of having to pull all that data out to an app server. Uh, all of those kinds of capabilities become unlocked with UDFs, as well as the ability to do the kind of MapReduce processing. Um, so, um, we're excited about uh, adding a lot of that functionality, but we're not losing track of the fact that our claim to fame within a lot of our customer base is the extraordinarily predictable and reliable key value store aspect. So we're trying to add all that stuff in. Uh, you can get our site both in Community Edition and in Enterprise Edition. So we are a closed source house, you can imagine that, uh, except for our clients. So if you're using our client, you can, uh, that, all that is source available because you're going to be bundling it into your application server. And, uh, you know, 
it makes sense for you to be able to do that at the source of the uh, The community edition, however, is, is pretty wide open, so there's no transaction limits, no time limits. Um, you can go to production on it, but you only get community support, and you also have a data size per cluster limit that's currently at 200 gigabytes. So it's great for things like you know, replacing, say, a Redis server um, that is, you know, not got appropriate clustering or doesn't use Flash, and then growing up from there. So hopefully I've hit all the points on my original slide. You can tell me if I did or didn't. Um, but that's uh, what we're currently looking at at Aerospike in terms of bringing the power of the analytics into that operational front end. Questions? Yes. So just an uh, operational type of question. Did you want to break in there? Yeah, it, well, just one moment. Uh, first off, before we go on to the Q&A, we are giving away a beautiful red Pebble watch. Um, to, if you haven't put your card or your information on a piece of paper or the back of the tissue box or whatever you got, uh, by all means, put it in. And you know, pass it around. Pass it around. Uh, and someone will win that watch. Um, questions? Yes. So, um, in terms of data centers that support uh, some of the configurations like you're suggesting, um, with high availability and physical security type of, what, who have you worked with? What recommendations do you have? Uh, so the question is, what have we, who have we worked with in terms of data center providers? Um, so the folks who you know are running uh, literally with their own rack space, you know, their own racks, not rack space, their own racks, uh, everything can support this. There's no real limitation there. We talked to about managed service providers, um, other than Amazon, I'll get to that in a minute. Um, all of them have SSD offerings, uh, and all of them have enough networking power to be able to do this kind of stuff to a greater and lesser extent. Um, I would say um, from our customers, I hear sort of iffy things about uh, software, for example. You know, that uh, we had one guy who's right, not right around the corner, but a couple blocks up, had a pretty poor experience, uh, and really liked, um, there's another company we're partnering with right now, doing a one button install with. So we try to find some of the, the better managed hosting guys. Uh, Rackspace seems fine, I would think they're middle tier, but it's a little above that in pricing. Uh, but they have a nice S SSD array. Uh, is there any particular one I could mention that you're thinking of? Or? Is Via West? Which one? Via West. I don't even know that. Sorry. So, so the good news is that uh, these days most uh, most managed hosting providers, other than Amazon, do support SSDs and have SSD configurations. So this is getting less and less weird to consider Flash. And um, Amazon will give you dedicated servers, or how is it? Is it purely cloud? Is that here from Amazon? Okay, great. Um, <laughs> <laughs> So, so I talk to Amazon for a lot. I talk to their, uh, uh, their VP of storage uh, uh, up in uh, uh, Seattle uh, and try to get the, talk them into doing uh, SSD-based uh, uh, hardware systems. And they, they've sort of met, uh, I think they've met the community halfway. Uh, so they have these things called the high I.O. instances that have 2.4 gig, uh, yeah, gig of flash. Uh, that's two cards, uh, 1.4 tera each. Um, it's not that fast, and they're supposed to be dedicated servers. Your VM is running one for one on a particular piece of hardware. Um, our experience with those is middling, I would say. It's, it's not performing anywhere near as it should, and you know, it's a virtual machine. We see about typically a, about a 2x virtual machine tax when using um, these kinds of systems, uh, mostly due to memory bus bandwidth issues. That's a, that's a big struggle within this kind of high performance system. Um, and besides that, then, you know, even though you have a dedicated 10 gig link on those things, you're still dealing with Amazon's network. So all of those things added up, I would say, you know, it's it's a solution. Um, uh, the other thing for us to do is to uh, offer bare metal just slightly off of Amazon's premise, but very, very close to it. And that's an area where I could actively investigate. Yes. yes. Oh, as, as, uh, I was going to say all the way in the back. There, in the back? Yeah, you. Uh, are there security implications? Is this a selling point? Um, so the question is, is there a trade-off regarding security? Um, clustered services are hard to manage for, for security, to be honest. And um, like most of the other NoSQL databases, um, we are expected to run within a secure environment already where there's you know, VLAN protection and 
uh, sort of uh, layer three security already. Uh, so uh, our ability to uh, provide security within this realm, it's, it's actually not that hard. So being able to do uh, role-based security, and, uh, sorry, role-based security on a table basis uh, through either LDAP or Active Directory, we've sort of been waiting for the first customer to come along and ask for it. So doing that and all, then also doing um, uh, uh, logging, uh, access logging for a distributed system, again, is kind of hard. But it's um, uh, the system we have for replicating our data to another cluster is very much the same system where we don't lose data in that way, so we wouldn't lose access logs, and we're able to do those in a distributed way. Um, the area we're planning on going beyond that is using user-defined functions to get uh, better than cell-based security because you can write your own UDFs and have those call out to uh, security callouts. So all of that stuff, you know, honestly, it's 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 more not that hard than. Um, than uh, something we have, it's more something we haven't gotten around to yet. Okay, uh, sorry, cut your question off. No, it's okay. Uh, so flash drives, as, as you write to them, they kind of uh, wear out, right? Yes. Um, is that an issue as you get into these really high transaction rates? Uh, so the question is, what happens with write durability of flash? Um, the shortest answer, um, and if you get to my last one where I talked the entire time about flash technology, um, there's a couple trends working in your favor. Um, first is, if you write too fast to one of these things, the read performance just goes to hell in a handbasket. So if you actually want to read your data, you're probably not writing too hard anyway. Um, so what we typically do is we go through uh, with an individual customer and say, how much are you going to be writing, what's your write speed, and how, much, how long do you want these drives to last? Uh, and because there's a variety of solutions in the marketplace. There's MLC, there's SLC, there's TLC, there's all this different stuff, right? Um, and they have different uh, write performances as well. Um, typically, everyone says, you know what, if I can get up to three years worth of durability, I've already written off the cost. And so as long as I can get past that point, and uh, I think in all of our deployments, uh, the durability of MLC has never been an issue at the three-year time frame. Now, now, I understand that uh, coming down the line, there are some technologies that get rid of that problem. Yes. How far away are those? And exactly which path we're all going to take. So, you know, um, most everyone these days is, are just coming out with what they call uh, 10 drive. The, the new, new terminology for this is the number of writes, rewrites you can do of the drive per day. So if you've got a one terabyte drive, you can rewrite the entire thing how many times per day and still maintain a five-year lifespan. What they're all calculating to. Um, and uh, the, their drives that have the three, three writes per day, five writes per day, ten writes per day, uh, rewrite per day uh, level. So that's where we're at today. Are we going to get out to 100 pretty soon? Yeah, probably. Although, honestly, people are focusing a little more on density than they are on that problem. I think my, my crystal ball would say we're going to say 10 for a bit. Brian, do you, uh, you mentioned before I have Nexus. Do you recall what their lifespan was on their drives? It's quite comical. Um, well, they had a lot of problems with their initial X25s, which were not in use in our system. So they had another piece of a software vendor called Schooner that was using the X25s. So everything that Mike says about drive failures was not under our watch. Okay, but under Schooner, do you recall what this is what it was? I wasn't there. Oh, uh, six, six weeks. They had a six. They have a six-week lifespan before they were out of drives at Texas. Every six weeks, total new cycle of drives. And so one of the benefits, again, this isn't my flash-based yeah. talk, is. Um, the way we write to the drives, we have a very predictable uh, wear amplification. So if you use a standard file system, you tend to get a lot of rewrites and hotspots of data, and we're exactly 2x over your writes. So that's another factor in being able to be uh, flash optimized. Uh, next question? Yes. How do you support the system you mentioned something like the Android That's true. So uh, in terms of persistence, so the question is, uh, how does Aerospike support persistence? Um, so uh, we support ACID on a row-by-row -row basis. So the durability and isolation that you get on a row-by-row -row basis is what we do. And the way we do that is we write to the map. The, the real benefit of the system is it's still a master replica writing system when it comes to persistence, isolation, durability, because there's no shortcuts to data reliability. Um, and then the benefit is, instead of trying to run some horrendously complicated access distributed consensus over a number of nodes, once you get to this point, if you have a master and a slave, you can apply a lot of the standard database transaction commit semantics. So a lot of our customers today are writing everything to RAM, 
and, um, and they're willing to live with the fact that uh, there's often about a 10 millisecond delay getting from RAM into the commit on disk. Now we could uh, delay the right transactions another 10 milliseconds and get the full transactional uh, durability guarantee of writing full to through to disk. And honestly, most people, they say, well, you know what? 10 milliseconds and multiple servers went down because I, I still got the other one that was the transaction was committed to. That probably means I had a, 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 a data center outage. If I had a data center outage, the machine that I reported to that the transaction was complete probably just crashed also. Mm -hmm. So, you know, who's watching the watchers? And so you sort of work through all that on a practical basis and you say, you know, I'm willing to live with a 10 millisecond slot because honestly, this is, this, if you, anyone actually doing banking and, and knows banking transactions? Yeah. So they don't use SQL. They don't use asset. Right? They use XA transactions, they have rollback, roll forward transaction life, life cycle stuff. So if you're really, really serious, you actually have to be able, to, you'll see errors in your uh, bank account that then they uh, reconcile again later. That's the way you actually do it. Um, this is safe enough for most people. We can also spend that extra 10 milliseconds of latency for the same price in throughput. So if there's an increasing agency, how would you Sorry, I can't hear you. Uh, how do you, uh, since you mentioned there's a 10 millisecond latency, how do you take care of the low locking condition? Is that is a race condition? The race condition, uh, there's not a race condition between the in memory commit. The in, commit, in memory commit is not safely. The only delay is the delay to storage. So you will have the case where you, if you are running in that consistency mode with our system, you may lose the last 10 milliseconds worth of writes. If you have multiple service crash, in memory you still. Yep. Yeah. So you know, within that 10 minutes that, period. That's not what I'm talking about. So, um, in memory, we handle all of those cases. So if no servers crash, there is no hole. The data is perfectly reliable, perfectly consistent. Okay. Next question. Right here. Open stack. No. We'd like to be, do you have any money? <laughs> okay, next one. Great to see you. All right. Uh, we're going to now give away the uh, beautiful red pebble watch. Um, has everyone had a chance to put their card in for the raffle? Yes, anybody want last chance? Okay, excuse me. Please close your eyes, fix it up, and grab the card out. Close your eyes. You gotta close your eyes. Read it out loud. Um, Ar Arkady Nemirovsky. He left. He left? Oh. <laughs> well, that cost him a pebble. Oh, you're here. Uh. Almost cost you a pebble watch. <laughs> Thank you. Enjoy. Thank you all. Brian Bukowski, CTO and founder of Aerosmith. Thank you. Today. Hang around if you've got any specific questions. And also, that fellow there who's raising his hand is our uh, East Coast wonderful SE, uh, who is uh, an expert, uh, a great guy, and he can answer all your questions too. So thank you. Thank you very much for coming out. Thank you.